thank you one and all for showing up to uh, this new edition of Haskellers. Uh, today we have another very special guest, which is Auke here, who uh, is going to regale us with um, his uh, answer to a question that uh, implicitly has probably bedeviled many a uh, software engineer, namely, what are exact real numbers? Um, and I suppose to those of us who don't deal with numeric code explicitly every day, this uh, might at first seem a bit of an abstract question, but uh, everybody who's ever had to deal with JavaScript randomly deciding to round a number uh, in a way it wasn't supposed to uh, will, I think, intimately have felt the impact of such things even when you're uh, writing code that seems more pedestrian. The... So I'm very happy to see and hear the talk we are about to receive. So please give it up for Auke. Thanks a lot, Kazem, and thanks for the introduction. I think it was uh, very accurate and it sets a high bar to, uh, for me to jump over, so I'll do my best. The way I normally present, I always say, please interrupt me, please ask questions in the middle of my talk, please just speak over me. I'm Dutch, so it's okay. Uh, you, can just, you can just speak up and, and uh, I'll do my best to repeat the question. Remind me if I don't repeat the question. Um, um, uh, yeah, interactive, uh, interactive speaking works best for me, so, so don't, don't hesitate to do so. Um, yeah, so just real quick, who am I? I'm a software engineer here in Zurich. Um, I, uh, uh, before that I did a PhD in computer science and um, out of that came some work which was originally more phrased in the area of type theory and in particular homotopy type theory, but it has a very, um, uh, it has a pretty straightforward translation to the Haskell world and this is something that uh, I haven't talked about before and I think there would be uh, interest in it in, in the Haskell community. Um, and that's why, that's why I'm telling you this today to hopefully do this knowledge transfer. Um, there's a lot of answers that I won't give. There's a lot of things that I won't be able to explain because it is a pretty um, um, complex topic, which sometimes also requires some heavier math. I'm sorry, I'll try to keep it as simple as possible. Uh, uh, um, um, uh, I think that part of the challenge that I'm trying to, uh, trying to uh, accept with this talk is to make this story more uh, uh, more mundane, easier to grasp for kind of um, programmers without a solid mathematics background. So what are we gonna talk to about today? I'm gonna start with a demo, which I just realized I didn't set up yet. So I have, like, let's see how long that takes. <laughs> um, uh, and then, uh, so I'm starting with the demo because I know from watching presentations that this is what gets your attention, right? You have to see what happens and then we can talk about what just happened, what we just saw. Um, so I'll start with that, then I'll talk with applications, why I want to say something uh, uh, about what exact real numbers are. And I have to talk a little bit about the mathematical background of, of, of all of that stuff. And only then in part four, in chapter four, I will talk about what my actual contribution here is, what the new idea is. And I'm very much postponing telling you what that new abstraction is, um, because I want you to first see why we need one, why we need to rethink the situation with exact real numbers, particularly in Haskell, but also more generally in functional programming, why we need more innovative ideas there. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to start with the demo now. Maybe at this point we can pause the recording for a second or like uh, cut out a piece because it will take me a few minutes to set up. I just realized I hadn't, I hadn't opened it. All right. Um, so um, what we're going to do is compute with real numbers. And um, kind of generally speaking, the way that's, that we're going to do it is something like, well, I'm going to print some, oops, I guess I, I can skip the print. So let's say S to your double. I'll explain what all of these things mean. And then I say uh, Q3 and uh, two. Uh, oh, why is this not in scope? I guess we have to restart this later. Well, I guess because I should call it somewhere, uh, something else. Mm, right. There we go. Okay, let me restart that. Luckily, you can edit in post. That's great. I'm going to repeat this about seven times, and then after the, like the eighth recording will be great. All right, so we're going to compute with real numbers. And let me uh, first, uh, first just type some code and then I explain what all the elements that you're looking at are. All right, so we computed the number three. Um, it's specified over here. Uh, I, I mean, I can enter a different number here. There you go. Um, and so 
I, I'm computing with, with real numbers. And in, th in this case, it's just a rational number. It's not very exciting. And then um, over here in, in these brackets, I'm going to do a bunch of computations. And then at the end of the day, I want to print some results. And that's what, SDR, what I do with SDR double. I convert it to a double and I use two decimals of precision. So what I could also do is maybe add to uh, this number 42, I add the number E. So, sorry, the syntax is a bit awkward. This is all just proof of concept. Uh, so here's the, the constant E that you know from your mathematics classes and exponentials. And here's the rational 42. And you see that it does compute some value uh, which does up to two decimals of precision uh, uh, approximate E plus 42. I can also similarly work with time, like a uh, multiplication. I can do exponentiation. Lots of operators here work. It all looks pretty bad. I'll admit that very much. Um, it's just a proof of concept. And now I'm going to explain what that means, what I just did, and why, well, why A, you should be impressed by this, and B, why it was so darn slow to just compute E plus 42. All right, so now I'll go back to the presentation. So exact reals have at the moment a very limited application uh, throughout programming. Um, and I want to show you kind of one of the exceptions that I'm aware of. Um, because, uh, well, <laughs> because we should rather understand the few exceptions that are out there. And also here, well, um, I'm sorry, like, I'm showing formulae, and I know the joke here, when you show formulae, you lose at least three quarters of your, of your, of your audience. You chose to come to a talk about the real number, so this is on you. Anyway, you, you don't need to understand what's going on with the formula here exactly. I'm just trying to make, so if, if you study some mathematics, you might recognize this formula for computing the, the, the number E. And it's a very well-known formula. This is very mundane mathematics. There's nothing exciting here going on. Anyway, computers struggle with computing approximations of E using this simple formula. And of course, we're all familiar with this, because if you do this in something like 64-bit floating point arithmetic, well, let's do it up to some precision here with, uh, with this, like first I choose 10 for K, which indicates the pre precision. Um, well, first, uh, everything's going fine. Uh, we, can, we can add one to a, to, to a small value, and it's, it's all fine, and we get a pretty good approximation for the value E. Um, but then when we bump the precision, we get not some approximation of one, but the actual value one, and everything breaks down. And the final result, the final approximation to E is completely wrong. So this is well known about floating point numbers. What's, what's not so broadly discussed is that with exact real numbers, you can uh, avoid this problem yeah. by avoiding loss of precision entirely. And this happens today on your phone. If you have an Android phone with Google Calculator installed, you can do this. Google Calculator is one of the few pieces of software that's widely um, installed that can that, that does use uh, exact real numbers internally. And so here I'm computing up to, like here I used 50 as, as my k, right? Which it should be a much better approximation of e. And it returns the result very quickly and it's, it's correct. Because it's not using floating points internally, but exact real numbers. So this is in a sense really magical. Um, and I think it even has like scrollable results. So if you pull this number to the to the left, then you can get more and more digits, etc. At the same time, the fact that it's only in something like well, in this one app and um, not not used much more broadly, also shows you that uh, it has like clearly there are some limitations to um, to how we're how we're working with exact real numbers. And so in fact, this Google Calculator app does a few tricks to, like it really does its best to avoid using exact reals as much as it can. Um, so it prefers using finite precision when it can. Uh, uh, it, it prefers to use symbolic uh, uh, computation when it can. It prefers to compute with, with, uh, with rationals when it can. Um, and that's, that's for both for getting better performance because exact real numbers are not performing well compared to finite precision. It's like completely incomparable uh, in terms of performance. And also because um, it's nicer if you get a result that says, you know, if you do some complicated computation, it just says, okay, you just computed E plus seven, you know? So 
we need to improve exact reels even for uh, a simple application such as a calculator. And kind of, I would say, we should be looking more broadly at like computation, like improving the way we compute with numbers, with 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 real numbers in computers. I mean, here there's a like I, I just kind of off the top of my head came up with a few areas where we're working with real numbers, and we should think about like isn't there an application of of exact reals there? And of course, they're all blocked by a couple of, of shortcomings of exact reals in general. Um, but this is kind of the stuff that we should try to. Uh, strive for, and, and we should not be happy with the status quo. All right, so now I have to jump a little bit into the mathematics of, of what exact reals, where exact reals come from, and how to set them up, and how to define them, um, etc. So this is very much a foundationalist's take on, on what, um, what the numbers are, uh, like in, in mathematical foundations, I mean. So if we want to define something like the real numbers as a structure in, in, in a mathematical foundations, what we first have to go to do is set up all of these preceding uh, um, sets or the preceding types. And so you would start by, by doing your piano arithmetic here in, in the natural domain, like in the domain of natural numbers. Then you build up your, 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 um, your, your rings uh, and do your abstract algebra once you have the integers. Uh, then you add uh, you add division, um, um, so you add division to your integers, which gives you your first field, if if that's a term that you're familiar with. And then finally, we add limits of certain sequences to obtain the real numbers. Um, and if you want to go further into calculus, then you could also add um, uh, you could take the algebraic closure, uh, adding roots of uh, certain polynomials. So let's walk through this a little bit step by step to. Um, understand how mathematicians approach this so we can hopefully understand and I think that's also my general kind of takeaway here is like can we do exact reals in a way that's closer to the mathematics um, so that we have a better abstraction that matches the mathematics. All right so here's your here's your Haskell explanation of what those more down-to-earth number types are. Uh, here's here's um, well the, the the first definition of the natural numbers everybody here should be familiar with. It's not the only one, right? It's not the only way to define the real number, uh, to define the natural number. So here, here I put a second one, which um, you could could call the binary natural numbers, um, and it has kind of the same um, same uh, properties. It works the same way as, as as this definition, but instead of two constructors, you have three constructors, and that ends up uh, saving you uh, data when you want to store certain uh, certain natural numbers. So, for instance, the number five here. In this representation, you have to store as the successor of 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 zero. I hope I got the number of successors right. Whereas in the binary representation, you know, it's it's a shorter it's a shorter representation. There are also, of course, um, uh, like you, you you could take this idea of optimizing representations a bit further and add maybe more constructors here or use some kind of a tree like. Um, tree-like structure, uh, you could kind of try to benefit from machine, machine integers or uh, integers or external li libraries such as GMP. Um, anyway, so already here at the level of, 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 of natural numbers, there is like work to be done, right? This is already, this is already <laughs> hairy, so. Um, Then there's the integers, and you can say, well, you just you just take the, the natural numbers and add negatives. But how do you actually do that if you want to really neatly do it in, in something like Haskell, right? And a straightforward way to do it is to say, well, we just have either a non-negative natural or a, a negative natural, right? So one corresponding to plus uh, of some natural number and one corresponding to uh, minus one minus n of some natural number. You also get to zero. This way you, you don't because I added the minus one here in my interpretation. So yes, but you you could add, you could add, end up having two zeros. Yes, um, 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 and that that would then also have to be that would also be something you would have to deal with in all of your inductive uh, definitions, all of your proofs of associativity, commutativity, etc. All of your algebra kind of um, gets more complicated the more constructors you add. And already this simple representation of either non-negative or negative is um, uh, well. The first couple of proofs work out very well. The first couple of definitions work out very well. But once you get kind of really down into it, uh, and you do a, a, something like associativity of multiplication, this gets pretty pretty hairy. 
So you could say, well, could we maybe have a representation in which we only have one constructor, which I called plus min here. Uh, and there indeed you get, you lose the uniqueness of representations of values. So for instance, the number zero could be represented as zero minus zero or one minus one or two minus two, et cetera. So again, already at this level, there are smart ideas or like there's, there's room for smart ideas. Right. Yeah. So there, there are. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so I think the. the yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah. so the, the proposal from the audience is that you could also use something like equivalence classes to represent uh, the construction from the integers uh, out of the naturals. Uh, and that's, that's true, and then you have to talk about equivalence classes in, well, in something like Haskell, that's, that's doable, but it requires extra work. And, and uh, um, uh, there are other languages in which it's arguably more convenient, but yeah, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a design, um, there's a design space for, 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 for these representations. And we have to work up to the to the rationals. Remember, we're trying to get to the real numbers, right? So we're pretty close now because here we're already in a in a place where we can do something like division, which is great. Um, this is a common representation. We just say, well, we do we represent a over b, where a and b are integers, as one constructor. Again, we have the ambiguity here of of representation, right? So um, one over one equals two over two equals three over three, etc. And so that means that when you're doing these when you're doing computations with these rationals, you would have to at some point decide to divide out common denominators of the A's and the B's. So when do you decide to do that? When is the right time to divide out common denominators? That might have a very big impact on how efficient your computations are. So in some sense, it's an even bigger problem than we had for integers. All right, finally, I think I'm ready to talk about, and I do realize I'm putting it off as long as I can, about real numbers, so thanks for your patience. So let's let's talk very concretely, right? So let's say we're having we're looking at a number like pi or e. How can we represent this in a language such as Haskell? Well, I mean the the three I would say is pretty easy because that's just some kind of integral part of of the number. We can just have that as a separate field of our of our of our real number. So I have that over here, right? So this integer over here would contain. Um, would contain the, the, the integral component. And then there's a fractional part, one, four, one, five, nine, dot, dot, dot. That's generally speaking, well, that's, it, the mathematicians would say there are always infinitely many decimals um, because you know if there are no more decimals, you just say there's zero, 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 zero. So let's just say that it's an infinite stream of, uh, of decimals and those decimals are all either zero, one, two, three, until nine. Um, so, so here you go, right? Here's the representation. It's just a function from the naturals to the di uh, to, to digits. Why? So why am I talking about Haskell? Because Haskell is a higher order language. That's, that's the power that we need from Haskell to represent real numbers. And in fact, that's what you need from any, from any, from any programming language. If we, if you want to do exact real numbers, you need, you need a higher order language. So yeah, it seems that this kind of, uh, this, uh, this first attempt at representing real numbers in, in, in Haskell work out, works out. But we'll see in a moment that it's deeply flawed. So to see why it's flawed, um, I have an exercise for you. Uh, well, we'll do it together, don't worry. Um, let's say we're given such a representation for an input number x. Uh, so x is one of these real numbers from the previous slide, right? So it's, 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 it's the constructor real with, with two fields. And I'm challenged to produce a representation for 3x, 3 times x. Okay, so let's just pattern match on the input, right? Well, it's, it's a real, um, and I get the first field, turns out it was a zero. And the second field, well, is, remember, it's a, it's a function, right? We cannot pattern match on functions. We just know it's a function. Okay, um, so this is something like zero dot 
question mark, question mark, question mark. Okay, we should produce some output real numbers. Let's say it's we use the real constructor. Let's think about what's the what's the integral part of that, right? Well, it de depends on what 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 follows after the dot here. So let's just inspect a couple of values. Ah, the first de the first decimal was uh, was one. All right. So we're looking at zero dot one something. Great. So three times zero dot one something is uh, zero dot three something, or maybe zero dot four, maybe zero dot five, but it's it's certainly not going to exceed one, and that's the important part, because it means that we can now say that the integral co component we can choose to be zero. Okay, same exercise. Now the first digit was a three. What do we do, right? Oh, we don't know, so we have to inspect more values. Ah, the second decimal was a four. Great, so now we can make up our minds because three times zero dot three four or something, something, some, something is certainly going to exceed one. So we can give an in integral part of one. Same exercise. First digit three, second digit three, third digit three. You never know. You never know, right? You never know where it's going to go. Is it going to exceed one, yes or no? So actually, we like, there's no there's no uh, um, there is no correct choice of integral component here. Already, the the function times three is not computable in this representation. And actually, this is in some sense a very old problem when computing with real numbers, like when trying to do something like real numbers and and computing with them. So it comes it goes all the way back to the original paper. The original paper that doesn't just introduce the notion of computable real numbers by Alan Turing. By the way, look at the year. It also like it also introduces the entire notion of computability in the first place. This is the seminal paper on computability, and it, it went straight to computable real numbers. This is when Turing machines were introduced. And here, the the thing to note here is calculable by finite means. That's that's something you should keep in mind for the rest of the talk. Calculable by finite means. We cannot, so kind of going back to our, 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 our 0 0.3 example, right? We cannot ex inspect the entire sequence of digits. We have to, we have to limit our attention to uh, some initial segment. So in fact, Turing made the exact same mistake that we are, that we just made before with our representation of real numbers. And he had to produce, he had to publish a correction to his paper. And this is it, or this is some excerpt of it. Um, and uh, well, there's a lot happening here. You can you can ignore all the math. The thing to point out here is at all the way at the bottom of the slide that says the principle of excluded middle. And again, if you're a little bit into your mathematics, then you may have heard this action before. The thing to know about the principle of excluded middle, which you know you can have an opinion about, but the thing to know about it, the fact about it, is it's not computable. And that corresponds in Turing's world to not being able to compute certain uh, certain real numbers. So this is kind of, I'll, I'll make a bit of an aside here. This is kind of what a lot of work with exact reals is like. You try to, you try to do something very simple and you think you have all of your definitions right because like, what else could it be? And then kind of turns out that you're job seems kind of difficult and actually it's not just difficult it's impossible there are lots of no-go theorems there are lots of dead ends in 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 this world of exact real numbers many things you would like to compute turn out to be uncomputable in general and that makes working with exact real numbers kind of a house of cards which is very delicate and it it, it seems that it seems that it's it's too sensitive to to everything you've set up and for me you know when i was studying this during my phd i even felt like how are we able to compute at even finite precision numbers? You know, given the fact that it's so difficult to set up everything right for exact real numbers, how can we? How how did we even manage for 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 finite uh, for finite precision, such as you know working with floats? Uh, and kind of over the over the years, I I, I kind of came to realize that um, you know with a solid enough understanding of of the problems that you have in exact real numbers, you can recognize the exact same problems with uh, with floating point arithmetic as, as well, and kind of all the issues around um, a numerical stability with floating points, you know, they 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 trans they 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 are just a translated problem from computation with exact reals. 
Right, so this is kind of the classical solution uh, to, to Turing's problem. Instead of having the, your digits go from zero to nine, you have your digits go from minus nine up to nine. This is kind of the, the, the classical solution. And so this, just to give you a flavor of how, how such numbers work, right? So one point minus two is equal to 0 0.8. Because it's, it's a minus two, so you subtract it rather than add it. Right? Does this make sense? Yeah. Put your hand up if it doesn't. Can you say that again? I didn't get the question. Yeah, so normally we have our digits in, in, in decimal representation going from 0 until 9. And so, for instance, in 0 0.8, the 8 is in the first decimal place, which means it's 8 times 10 to the, mi 10 to the minus 1. Here there's a minus 2 in the first decimal place, which, which means we subtract 2, to the, 2 times 10 to the minus 1. Perfect. Does that help? So similarly, if, the, if you do something like 3 times 0 0.3, there's no problem to compute this anymore, even if, you know, even if you had more 3s over here. You don't need to know more about this number than its first decimal. You can just decide that the first digit is 1. And then later on you find out, oh, actually the second digit was a 0. Okay, so then we have to kind of adjust our thinking, but now downward. There's no problem to adjust both ways. Um, so the, the usual situation that you know, I'm gonna if if anybody disagrees with, with me uh, on this, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna discuss. 0 0.9 repeated is one. Like, like it's, there are more videos on YouTube on on that topic. But similarly, now we have a second representation for the number for the number one, which is two dot minus nine repeated. Right? So we get a lot of um, uh, so we add so uh, uh, so let me say it differently. Um, it was already the case that there was no unique representation for real numbers. We make that problem a whole lot worse this way. So here is our number e, right? And I've written, like just by hand, I, I wrote down a couple, right? But there are infinitely many. There are infinitely many representations for the same real number in this system. Can we check a little bit of light on how to that? Why is point nine 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 equal to one? Mm -hmm. Second one is clockwise, I suppose. Oh well, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, so this equal sign, the first equal sign, I'm not happy to talk about. The second one, I'm happy to talk about, right? So, so here. Um, is that right? Was it asking about the first one, yeah. This one. Yeah. Yeah. That, um, um, uh, yeah. Let's let's take that for for after the talk. Yeah. I think the 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 the, the thing that is that I'm happy to say here is that um, zero dot nine repeated. It's not in itself a real number. It's a symbolic representation for a, 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 a deeper thing. And it, it, it just so happens that this one and this one represent the same underlying thing. Got it. What would 0.333 be then? 133. Ah, got it. Okay. Okay, good. Thanks. Yeah. The space of repeating the way Oh, sorry, I think I didn't realize, uh, I didn't repeat the question, so uh, I, I, I hope that's okay. You should remind me better. <laughs> um, right, so, and I think for me, this whole, uh, it, it, I, I feel deep, uh, uh, like, I, I, for me, it's clear that this is an unsatisfactory situation because all of this uh, talk about digits and representations, it's, it's very different from how mathematicians talk about and define real numbers. Um, uh, it's just a, a complete impedance mismatch with, with how they talk about the definition of numbers. And so the question then is, can we avoid this? And is there some alternative? And, and then that's finally working towards, uh, uh, well, first I have another representation. I guess I'm also happy to skip it. Anyway, the, so here's another way to think about representing real numbers on a computer. This is with sequences of nested intervals. So this is like interval notation. So numbers between two and three, right? So the, the point here is that if you go deeper and deeper into the sequence, you get a, a sharper and sharper interval around the real number that you're trying to represent. Um, and then the point is that all, like, the, the things along the way, right? The, these endpoints, these can be rational. We know how to represent them on, on a computer. But still, your entire sequence focuses on a real number. So, so in that sense, you have a representation for, for real numbers. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It's still awkward. It still doesn't connect to what mathematicians call a real number. It's still unenlightening. Can we match the mathematics better? Yeah, also, you eventually run out of the facilities for your bonds. 
you eventually run out of precision for your bounds, well, um, you could have like arbitrary precision uh, uh, rationals, here, right? Which is what I also showed on slide whatever where we were when we were defining the rational numbers. Um, right, so this is uh, like here I, I also use this rational data type, which is uh, and, and integers which are arbitrary precision, or at least like arbitrary enough, right? It's uh, right, this, this, this is just from NASCO library. Uh, where was I? Thanks. All right, so finally getting a little bit closer to the mathematics. Uh, what are, like forget about exact real numbers. What are real numbers anyway? Uh, I, like, and, and this, is going, this is touching on the question, what is the mathematical definition of, of a real number? And this you would probably see if you study mathematics and probably not if you didn't study mathematics. So I don't expect you to understand anything that, that I'm saying here. Like one thing to observe again is that there are different definitions uh, and, and there's a lot to cover in terms of background, which we won't. Um, regardless, we will be able to understand a little bit of what the mathematical definition of a real number is. And the, the, the clue here is, is in the third one, right? In, in dedicated cuts. That's where we get a hint of, of what, uh, how from a programmer's point of view, we can better understand real numbers. Um, maybe the only thing, no, okay, let me, let me skip that. Um, right, and, and so the thing to, to, to keep in mind here for dedicated cuts is that, uh, they, they, so they, they are, they are a choice of subsets of the rationals. Rationals, again, we can represent very well on a computer. And they kind of, they, they form, uh, they, they kind of point out the, re the real number by picking all of the rational numbers on its left and all of the rational numbers on its right. So I, I don't know if anybody struggles with the interval notation here, but this is the interval of all rational numbers less than E and the interval of all rational numbers bigger than E. Um, so, right, so this can all be defined directly from the rationals, which, which I accept for the purpose of this, of this presentation. So finally, I get to the to the actual new abstraction that I want to propose for for exact real numbers, and like, I don't want to say that it's a good representation. In fact, it's terrible. You saw me do a computation with it earlier in the demo. It's slow. It's it's not super easy to do the like these these uh, this make making the plus and making the times. You know, all these computations with them are not exactly straightforward, but they are easy to interpret mathematically, and they are have a very clear link to the mathematics, and that's kind of the new element here. So what is a locator? Um, the, a locator is a machine that answers a specific kind of question. And the question that it answers is, you give it two rational numbers, and then the first one has to be less than the second, that's the rule. Uh, and x is, the real num x is the real number that it talks about. And it has to answer either of these, either of these, um, it has to provide the, the, uh, a bit that's, that indicates one of these two situations. It either has to say that Q is less than X, or it has to say that X is less than R. Now, if you look at the particular scenario that I draw over here in, in the number line, you see that, well, Q is indeed less than X, but R is not, uh, sorry, uh, X is not actually less than R. This second scenario is invalid. So in fact, there's only one thing that the locator can do in this scenario, which is to give, the give a bit indicating the first one. Similarly, if X were on the other side, if X were over here, well then X would be less than R, but, it, uh, but Q would not be less than X. So, uh, the, second, uh, so the first scenario would, would be ruled out and it has to answer the second one. And then finally I'll, I'll, I'll ask like, what happens if it's here in the middle? Both are true, right. So it can answer either. And that's fine. Sorry about that? It only needs to answer one. It, it, can, it has to provide an answer and it can make a choice what it wants to do. So in particular, locators for a given real number are not unique. We don't have a unique representation. Are there any questions here about the definition? I'll, I'll also talk about this in Haskell terms, but uh, at least from the picture, is there, are there any questions? Yes, go ahead. So my question is, a locator is defined for an X and Q and R are arguments that you give in every time, or does the locator also 
Right, so the question is, is the locator defined in terms of just X or is it defined also in terms of Q and R? And the answer is that it's defined only in terms of X. So it's a machine for X and that machine accepts Q and R as inputs. Yeah. Um, I guess what I'm confused by is the idea of it as a machine that has to answer either question. Um, so you define a locator for X you give it Q and R as inputs. What is the output? <laughs> Will it? Right. So how do you? So your question is basically how do you actually give these answers? Yes. Or even which one does it give? Right. Because it, you say it has to answer either one, and it can pick one. Right. So um, uh, it's you will be uh, you'll be like I'll, I'll I'll jump to the Haskell code to to show you how it does the answering. Does invalid just mean false? Does invalid mean false? Uh, yes, but um, uh, I would. Um, um, it, it's it's false, but it's not the Boolean false. I would say, and I emphasize that because in general, this statement whether x is less than r, where x is a real number, cannot be decided. We cannot compute a Boolean uh, to decide this statement. Um, anyway, let's jump to the Haskell code, and then I think some of the last two questions uh, uh, might make more sense. Uh, right. So here's 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 uh, my definition of of a locator. So here here are the two answers, right? So we have a location. Either we locate on the left or we locate on the right. That so that's the representation for those two cases that we saw before. And so here, I mean, you can argue about uh, left and right. What makes more sense to call what? And this is kind of a, the same issue as like. Is the charge on the, on the electron positive or negative? I might very well be making a mistake here. Um, anyway, this is this is the convention that I chose. If I say locates left, it means that uh, x was less than the uh, than the r that we gave as the input. And so the type of locators is simply functions that accept two rationals as input and output a location. Does this answer your earlier question about how the machine works? And here the, the contract is that the two arguments also uh, always have to satisfy this criterion that the first argument has to be less than the second argument. Uh, in the alternative case, any like anything is allowed. So this is kind of a, 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 a like this is a, a lazy way to to kind of uh, I mean you could you, you could do a different encoding of, of this type where where you know um, um, that that contract would be encoded somehow in the arguments, but. This is the more straightforward way to do it. We just ignore the inputs if, 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 the, if this condition is not satisfied. So, do these locators look okay? So, how do we do these constructions with locators? Uh, how do we um, how do we get our exact real number analysis going? So, this is um, the construction of a locator for rational numbers, which should be pretty straightforward, right? So, given a rational number s, can we get a locator for s? So here's one construction. I take my take my s and it, it gives me a locator and a locator has to take two arguments. So here they are, q uh, q and q and r are the two inputs. I don't check actually whether q is less than r. I just you know that's that's the going contract. So like I can do whatever in, in the alternative case. So I just assume that q is less than r. Then I compare the the the, the this q I compare with s, um, and then if if that holds. Uh, and by the way, this is now a comparison between two rational numbers, and comparisons between rational numbers are decidable, so there's no 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 problem here. Then I can locate right, and in the other case, I can locate left. So, uh, sorry, yeah, you have to draw the picture to see that this is correct, but this is correct. There's a second construction, which also is a valid locator for S. So again, you t for, for, for S, we construct a locator. So we take the two inputs, Q and R. Now we compare S with R directly. If it holds, we can locate left. These two locators are different. This, and it, it, you see the difference exactly when you're in this in-between scenario that we discussed before. Similar, so here's an, another construction that you can do with locators. So here's... Oh, like, um, uh, um, what's the algebra that you can do, right, with locators? So here's, if you have a locator for x, can we get a locator for minus x? And it's a two-step construction. So first we define opposite, which just flips the, flips the locations on the left and the right. 
And if you then want to compute minuses for locators, well, here you, you take your locator, which I call X here as an input. You just take it, you take your two inputs for the output locator, and you evaluate X on the flipped inputs, and then you take the flip of the location. Again, you have to draw the picture to see that it is correct, but it is correct. And in particular, it works because if Q is less than R, then minus R is less than minus Q. So this is kind of how, how, this, um, how these constructions with locators work. I mean, it's not like, I'm not expecting you to now go and do all of this, uh, for, like, I'm not expecting you to come up with this on the spot. Uh, it's, like, there's a lot of inequalities here and it's, it's difficult to, to, to um, what's the word? To, um, to keep those all organized in your head. Uh, but, but the thing to see is that it's pretty, it's a, it has a pretty mathematical flavor. It has a pretty mathematical and algebraic um, approach to it, which is very different from the constructions with, for instance, uh, decimal representations. So yeah, we just, we just did constructors for minus x, and then as a fact, I give you that you can also get locators for x plus y, x times y, x over y, the, the, the minimum of two, of two locators and the maximum of, of two locators. I present these as facts. Actually, some of them, such as plus and times, are uh, not straightforward. Um, so what's easy about the locator is their definition and their mathematical interpretation as a real number. Their construction, like the construction of locators, is not always straightforward, even it has, if it has a very algebraic feel to it. Um, and uh, um, yeah, and their performance, well, we've already seen that is completely terrible. So now what can we do with these locators? Like, I, I think the, 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 the lesson to take until now is like, okay, we can take all of these locators and do of all of our computation with exact real numbers. So this is like my locator is, is, is my uh, specification for an exact real. Uh, we can do all of our computations with those exact reals. And then at the end of the day, after our computation is done, uh, choose, you know, how much precision we want to output on the screen when the computation is in a sense already completely done. So for instance, can we get kind of the order of magnitude of the, of the number that we computed, right? So th that's the question here. Can we get an integer number that is close to, to, to our, to the, to the locator that we have after, at the end of some computation? So this is the algorithm that I, that I, that I came up with for doing that. So what you do is you kind of, you, you test at various, um, various neighbors. So you test the locator on zero less than one. So you see either if it's, if it's in the right interval starting from zero or if it's in the left interval, uh, start like up, up until one. And you just, you know, first you do it here and then you do it here and then you do it here and then you do it there. You know, you just go, you flip back and forth, uh, like that, uh, going bigger and bigger. And then eventually you find uh, a, a, a neighboring pair that, like it, uh, yeah, you, you're guaranteed to find a, a neighboring pair that encloses the real number in a sense, and that allows you to then finally output the number. So here, in, for instance, if you know that two is less than x and x is less than four, then you can output uh, n equals three as your as your as your order of magnitude. So, like again, I'm not asking you to follow these constructions. I'm just kind of trying to give you a flavor of of how those constructions work uh, uh, once you have locators. So a bunch more facts, uh, you know, we can compute limits of convergent sequences this way. You know, with a bunch more setup, you can compute integrals. With a bunch more setup, you can compute uh, intersections of the x-axis. With a bunch more setup, you can compute uh, uh, solutions of differential equations. And, you know, this is all no loss, loss of precision along the, along the way of the computation. At the end of the day, when your computation is finally done, then you decide how much precision you want to show on the screen. So, yeah, how do you estimate time it takes to make such a calculation? How do you estimate the time that it takes to take to make such a calculation? Yeah, I, I, I would say if you do it with the, the with the code that I showed you, uh, and you do any kind of realistic computation, it probably takes too long, and you should go and do something else. Um, which is to say that this is completely under-engineered, and this is completely just a proof of concept. Uh, and, and, and I'm just trying to show an abstraction and for any kind of reasonable applic application, there's, there's a problem there. So yeah, you could say 
can we can we organize the code so that so that uh, for instance we tell it to compute for five seconds and show us the digits that we got until then we can say can we somehow uh, have our error bounding more precise so that uh, 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 we don't waste re uh, we don't waste time computing something up to a precision that we don't need that's all work that I didn't do um, So the comment is um, you need to um, compute, uh, you need to first make up your mind to what precision you need to know some value before you start the computation. You need to know your error bound before you start the computation. And this is referred to as backwards error propagation. So you, you have your big expression or you have your big thing that you want to compute and then you go backwards to say, okay, how much precision do we need here for that? How much precision do we need there for that? Actually, it turns out that that's not a great approach. You, like, I was surprised as well. Um, because most of the time you then still end up calculating things to way too high of a precision. And the approach that's more efficient and that's using a very different representation of exact reals, right? The approach that's more efficient is to do forward error propagation, which means you go inside out. It means you, you, you pick some random precision, some, some, uh, you know, some optimistic precision on the inside. You just see where, where, um, where the computation goes and then decide if it's precise enough. And if it's not precise enough, you go back and kind of update your intermediate values. Anyway, so that, like what I'm saying is there's, So, uh, the, so uh, the comment is that this is a, a, a kind to uh, experimental mathematics. And I think that there are some, uh, well, I think it's, um, I don't want to get it too much into a philosophical debate on what the nature of experimental mathematics is, but uh, it is an, indeed like by, by using an experimental algorithm, which is very precise and not uh, algorithmic in nature, uh, th then you can, uh, 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 then you can usually get better results. Anyway, yeah, that, that's all stuff that, that there is, there is, there are people working on this. They're having some results, which are not always negative, but it's, there are still not nowhere close to like getting these industry applications of exact reals, right? So I think we need, we need more than just kind of smart thinking about error propagation. The time it takes depends on the computation itself or also on the precision. Um, so are you asking about what what I did in my prototype or? No, about uh, the comment uh, and not knowing how long it takes. Uh, is it because of the computation or because of how much precision? So um, how long does it take to do these computations in this in in, in this in this uh, proof of concept that I wrote? I guess in theory you could predict, but you're going to spend more time trying to predict how long it takes than just improving the code somehow or finding a better better way to do it. Uh, uh, Is the time it takes dependent on your model or what you do? Um, not right. So uh, if you take if you do more if you do more operations, uh, your your computation would also take longer, right? right. Um, and and so I I have one slide where I give a concrete example of this. So in, in this proof of concept that I have, let's jump to it right away. Um, oh, that would have been the next slide. Um, like if you do two times two times two times two times two times two, you know, at some point I had a laptop and it took 23 seconds to, to get five decimals, uh, approximation here. Um, because of the nestedness of the multiplication here. So if I had, if I had, uh, associated this differently, it would have already been better. Um, and if I had just, uh, uh, computed digit approximations for the number two, it would have been much, much faster. It would have been a blink of an eye. 
adjust for more precision even though it's just one unit. So would it significantly increase the duration even though it's not doing any extra work? Uh, I, so uh, if you ask for more precision, how much longer does it take? Yeah, so I don't think I ever managed to do six digits. <laughs> or, if it, or if it did work, then it would take like 10 minutes. It's completely ridiculous what I, what I wrote. It's completely uh, uh, unworkable. It's just... I guess that answers the question from the audience. It seems that precision is what costs more than the computation. I, I find this... A, so... They're both, so, uh, so the question is, the, does this prove that precision costs more than the actual computation? I find this a difficult question to answer because uh, it's the combination that is costly. If you, if you just do the number two, then you can uh, calculate it up to quite high precision quite quickly. But still, like, still the modeling is completely terrible. Like, still computing 10 digits, 10 digits of the rational number two is not going to be as fast as it should be, which is instant. Right, um, and that's like that's that's something we have to work on. That's something where we have to uh, figure out better better internal representations, uh, 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 better ways to perhaps optimize this. But also, I would hope find better abstractions that allow us to avoid having to optimize in the first place. What about the super fast quantum computers? What about super fast quantum computers? Yeah, that's that was not the department where I was doing the PhD. So you would have to go uh, have to go to the physics department for that, I guess. Uh, I'm not sure if you when you compute like the uh, decimal representation, you do this search of intervals that it might be in. Right. So if you, yeah, if you do the decimal representation, you have to do the search with the intervals back and forth, which is kind of a into the expression, so it kind of repeats for every subject. Oh yes, that that propagates and is repeated all over the place, and uh, it's completely wasteful, and it's a uh, completely a, a, a brute force search. Uh, yeah. Be some some low hanging fruits in doing like a, a bisection algorithm. Could there be some low hanging fruits by by doing a bisection algorithm? Yes. Yes. And I didn't do that, and and uh, that was mainly to keep it, uh, keep the modeling and keep the interpretation as simple as possible. But yes, there is low hanging fruit. Uh, the thing to the th need to change the representation. I think it's just the algorithm to like find the ref button. So uh, yeah, um, okay. So yeah, for 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 this jumping back and forth, you could probably speed up quite a bit. But what you have to think about is um, the cost of doing that. So. It seems that so if, if you're just doing, uh, if you're just trying to find kind of uh, uh, what I call like order of magnitude of, of a rational, right, with, with this, then of course you want to just try big numbers and small numbers right away and do some kind of smart bisection to get to the, to the location right away. But it might be that merely asking, let me jump back to it, merely asking the question about, uh, 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 about, about a number with a very big argument might also be very costly. So, um, uh, yeah, then you have to have a plan about, you know, how you're going to avoid kind of running into problems down the line. Well, so the logarithm of infinity is still infinite. So, yeah, of course, but this doesn't really, like, unless you find a plan to bisect infinity, <laughs> doesn't really save much. All right, so, so the comment is basically saying uh, if you want to find order of magnitude of a number, it doesn't like jumping with exponential steps rather than just jumping by one every time. It's not necessarily uh, going to give you the speed up that you need because if you're going to, if you if you want to compute uh, the, you know, if you want to compute the order of magnitude of the Ackermann function, blah, 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 you're still going to have a very big number to jump to that is super exponential, right? So, yeah, so completely agreed with all of these thoughts and comments and I really appreciate that you're thinking along the right way. Just warning or at my, yeah, I don't know if it's a warning, but my feeling is that uh, I'm a bit hesitant to do the, to do the low hanging fruit first because then you're, you'll get stuck doing only the low hanging fruit optimizations, which maybe doesn't get you to kind of the, the right away uh, efficient approach, so to say. Um, uh, right, what's next? Uh, oh, did this one stop working now? I was very happy with the presenter, perhaps until just now. Ah, no, it stopped working. All right, I have to use the keys now. Does the pointer still, no, the pointer still works. Okay. 
But yeah, luckily it's not Bluetooth. So uh, anyway, so I'll, I'll just use the keyboard. Oh, is that not the computer? It's the computer. <laughs> oh no. Okay, at least the mouse works. So that's that's that, that's uh, that's a relief. So just to very briefly jump back to the mathematical origins of these locators, right? So we. Um, I'm going to touch on the question, like, what does this computation that we're doing in Haskell mean for the theory? Can we have any feedback in that direction, right? What's the mathematical picture of this of this locator object? Um, so, and why, like, what motivates me to, to make that jump back? It's because I came from the other direction, right? I came from formalized mathematics, um, and uh, in like then we're working with uh, proof assistants such as Akda, Kalkleen, a whole bunch more, but these are kind of popular at the moment. And there we uh, prove mathematics in the sense that we write programs that are element, like are terms of a certain type. Um, and these uh, proofs can then be kind of, there's kind of a, 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 there's a very clear computational interpretation of those proofs, which means that you're kind of at the same time doing the mathematics and doing the, the uh, writing the algorithms to do computations. And so kind of that's, that, that's what allows me to then go back and say, what does computation mean for the mean for the mathematics so previously i already had this picture of of like di different definitions of, of of real numbers and and i, I mentioned uh, or I, I showed on the screen i didn't discuss it but the, that there are three uh well-known definition or somewhat known definitions of real numbers and are known inclusions between them um and uh what i'm uh, what i I guess I didn't mention it literally, but these locators, we, we can get signed digit representations for them. Uh, we can uh, get sequences of nested intervals for them. So um, this is very much like a computational object that this is very much what proves them to be uh, exact reals that we can compute with. At the same time, due to their, um, um, uh, due to their, uh, 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 um, due to these interdefinabilities, we know that all the real num uh, all the real numbers for which we can define a locator are automatically Cauchy reals, whatever that means. Um, and so there's this very nice link between uh, these definitions of real numbers and reals that we can compute with. Namely, we can compute exactly, in other words, we have locators exactly for those reals that happen to be Cauchy reals. Okay, so look, I'm not, like, not saying that this is something you have to understand, but there, I'm just saying that there's mathematics here, right? There, there's, there's actual, um, um, there's a there's a very clear and elegant link to be made here. So I have to be careful with my phrasing here. So I'm working. Okay, so let me repeat the question. So the question was: Does uh, I guess the question is: Is there, is this inclusion strict? Right. So does this mean that there are dedicated kits uh, that there are dedicated cuts with which we cannot compute? I have to be careful with my phrasing because. I, uh, what I'm working in is, is a constructive mathematical foundation. Uh, and then a lot of questions that you would want to have a negative answer only have like, you cannot prove its opposite answer. Oops. Uh, and so that means uh, that I, can, I, cannot show, I cannot show these conclusions, uh, inclusions to be strict, but I do know that there is no proof that there are equalities. Uh, and so in that sense, we well, we know that we will that we will never find them. So um, you could then additionally make uh, fur further further. You could, if you would then add additional axioms to your system, then you could show these inclusions to be strict. So it's kind of neutral to an answer, and and we know we positively know that these foundations are neutral to an answer. Uh, I mean, there's already a difficulty in Cauchy sequences. You know, basically you have. Uh, A sequence of rational numbers, for example. Now, those sequences in general are infinite once they have uh, problems. Now, how do you get those into the computer? You can't. So basically, you, you will choose a subset of the Cauchy reals, namely those where the sequence of rationals can be represented by the formula, basically. In 
So it is it's this mathematician statement to say, well, take, take as a credited debiting cards, take the set. But the set is unrepresentable in general. You cannot represent all real numbers. You know, so, 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 you, you, you get to an intrinsic problem, you know, if you try to model real numbers on a computer. But my question is about computer, it's just what I've written. <laughs> so let me try to summarize and, and try to wrap up this the, this question as well. I, like so, there's the comment is uh, you have to perhaps make a choice about what you can represent in terms of sequences and algorithms on your computer in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. And this is that's where all of this stuff gets hairy. And I don't know how to explain that uh, in a way that everybody in the room will be with us and for that conversation, right? I don't know how to how to tell that story. I think I understand parts of it. I don't think I understand that fully. This is also touching on kind of foundational mathematical questions. You know, if you if you want to know more, read my PhD thesis. I have a chapter about foundations of mathematics. Sure, but for the purpose of today's uh, presentation, let's kind of sidestep that whole issue as much as we can uh, be because because it's a very complex story. And it's all dependent on your choice of foundations, uh, axioms that you accept, basic definitions that you make of your real numbers, of, of your exact real numbers. Uh, it's a mess. I'm sorry. This we, this we have to do a better job at, and I don't, I don't know how to do it yet. So finally, time for final questions. Uh, yeah, this, this is the, the Haskell code uh, that I was demoing before. Yeah, it's very messy. Uh, um, um, uh, uh, and it's just one file, so uh, I don't think there are comments in it, but just just to prove that it exists and it does compile. <laughs> uh, yeah, and and then my uh, my my PhD thesis, which does include a chapter on uh, kind of introducing homotopy type theory. So if you want to dive into that, you can give that a go as well. Uh, no no guarantees on how understandable it is. Yeah, so that was all. Questions, welcome. At this point, I don't really. Oh, sorry. The question is: Do you do I plan to continue working on the code? Uh, right now, I don't uh, know kind of where to take it next because I like I see that it's a nice abstraction, but I don't then know how to make that jump to something workable. And I think that's also kind of why I'm standing here trying to tell the story so that there may be more brains rattling on that on that question. Uh, so I so I think the answer is not immediately be, un, until I know how to how to how to make the next step. Do I ever decompile the Google Calculator to find out how it did it? Well, there's so there's a. Um, let me jump back to that so you can uh, see the link for that as well. Right. So here's 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 the QR code to a uh, to a uh, to a paper on it. There's also a pretty good YouTube uh, YouTube talk on that. So that that gives some uh, that gives some uh, that gives quite quite some information on, on how they do it. Um, basically. It says uh, we use a, a particular Java library for for the exact reals, but then with a whole bunch of optimizations on top of that to avoid using that. Um, I mean, I think it's, it's good to many computer algebras. It's, you know, they they give you the Google on the story. Infinity result. Right. So, so the impressive thing is that it's that is good enough that you can install it as an everyday app that that people that are not knowledgeable on mathematics at all can can use. Yes, and they don't encounter any problem. Reasonable time. Yeah. So that's that's very well engineered. And uh, uh, yeah. They, and they did it for fun, right? I mean, why else would you make a calculator with a why do, so they did it for fun? Why else would you do it? Well, because uh, be, be, because these kind of so already already the first point here answer exact results symbolically. That's that's a big one, right? So uh, if you can just say what you just computed was the number pi, that's a game changer in terms of your calculator actually helping you out. You know, um, um, 
so so being able to do a lot of things symbolically is like it's not just you know it doesn't just help with producing results faster it 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 it, it improves the quality of the answer as well can you show the haskell code that adds the locators yeah sure so the question is can we can i show the haskell code that adds two locators here it is all right so this is this takes two locators as inputs and it produces a new locator so that's why there are four arguments how does it do it it's so uh, it 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 does it does this forward it does this backward error propagation right and my my epsilon here, that's my notion of error. That's how precisely we need to compute uh, intermediate answers. And, and how it does this, it, it, it does it fairly. So half of the precision it, it sends to L and half of the precision it sends to M. Um, and so um, then it um, calls another helper function to compute a rather precise approximation to, to, the, to, the, to the first number. Um, yeah, and then does some more uh, adding up and, and uh, minus and plus, and then calls the second lake locator on, on 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 those values, and then it works out. But there's a lot of there's a lot of algebra behind this, and a lot of kind of inequalities to check that it that it computes the right thing. But according to my thesis, it does compute the right thing. Um, but yeah, so so I haven't shown you the full the full definition because I would also have to show you what then tight bound is, and that would be something that computes kind of uh, a, 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 good a good approximation to a number. So let's also then jump to that. I guess it was earlier, hold up. There we go. Uh, again, I have several implementations, so I, I chose, well, there's one, there's two. Anyway, so here we go. So we we compute a, a lower bound for the number, we compute an upper bound for the number, and I think this is up to precision one. Uh, and then it, it, does an, it does a certain uh, uh, search algorithm between the endpoints to, to find uh, an approximately, uh, to find a good approximation to, to the input number. So, so that's, that's a whole lot of computation involved to uh, compute uh, uh, partial approximations, and then it calls both locators. Right. So this computes an interval around the locator up to a certain precision that you that you define. So yeah, there's all, there's all kinds of small building blocks like this that are used to define something as simple as plus. So does so the question is doesn't the locator also have the problem with the 0 0.3 repeating times three like this calculation of times three right why, why is that not a problem for the locators? Um, so locators don't use so my cheap answer is locators are not digit representations. So to compute a locator as an output for you know times three, you don't need to compute a digit representation. And in particular, you don't need to compute an integral component of your output number. So there is no, there is no part of your desired output that is problematic. It, it is a cheap answer because, of course, at the end of the day, you can get these digit representations out. So uh, I, I do have, a, I do have, I'll show you in a second, I, I do have a method that computes a digit representation for a locator. So then you could say, okay, so Look, you should have had the same problem, right? Yes, except that. Is this the one that I wanted? Yes. Okay, so my, my solution is I compute signed digit representations. And then, of course, those can be converted to unsigned digit representations once you've already made up your mind about the precision. So if you already decided, like, I only want uh, three digits. So if you have a signed digit representation with three decimals, three digits after the de decimal point, 
then you can convert it to an unsigned dig digit representation. That's no problem. The problem is doing it for your entire sequence of, of, of decimals. I hope that answers your question, although it may have also raised a few new ones. So this means that the quality isn't influencing between both cases. You only have the quality between like six specific so this means that equality isn't implemented for locators. Thanks for bringing it up. I have a slide about that. No, we don't, we don't implement equality for locators because equality for real numbers is undecidable. Inequality for real numbers is undecidable. Both kinds are undecidable. There are all, this, is, this is coming to the, the no-go theorems that stop you from doing all kinds of computations that you would want to do. But once you pick some precision to which you represent your real, then this is the only way to achieve any kind of equality. So once you pick a certain precision to which you represent your reals, you can get the equality. Yeah, well, once you pick a precision, then I would say you're not in the domain of the real numbers anymore. So then you're working with kind of finite data, you know, uh, something equivalent, like something isomorphic to the to the natural numbers. So there's no problem anymore. Everything becomes decidable. Everything becomes printable. So yeah, once you fix your precision, then all of these kinds of problems disappear. Can you show me your definition of E or pi in your code? Can we see the definition of E or pi in the code? Yes. Ah, that was not a good shot. <laughs> yeah, E con con. No, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I just, you know what? I think I know roughly. I, I think I'll. I'll uh, where See, was this? This is why it's nice to have a definition keyword. Oh, yes, yes. The word def E, you would know where it is. Where was this? I think I think I got it. Okay, a limit. There we go. Ah, there was no colon because there was no type annotation. Because I I I just did this very quickly. So there's my definition of e. So it says I take the limit of a sequence. Uh, again, like this, the selling point here is that we can compute locators for limits of sequences, and here's my sequence defined as a function. So here n is the, the nth element of the sequence. So here's an approximate, the, here's the, the rational representing that, that, that element in the sequence. Now pi. Now pi, I didn't do pi. So, I, didn't, I didn't do pi because uh, I, uh, the, the formula for pi is a bit more tricky. Requires transcendental function. No, I don't think it does, uh, but uh, it's, it's more tricky. So uh, the, the, the most straightforward ones use uh, sums, uh, sums of other things. And uh, well, okay, maybe, maybe. Uh, so I think I, uh, the main reason is I was being lazy and I just did E and I thought it was already convincing. Um, you could do pi, I didn't do pi. Uh, I think pi would be a little bit more work than E, but probably uh, also doable. Exercise for the reader. Listen. The great privilege of the mathematician. The privilege of the mathematician. Yes. One one question. Um, is is make a limit in any way slower than something like make plus? Is make limit slower than make plus? So make limit is in some sense a, 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 a unary operator, right? It takes one sequence and outputs one locator, and so in that sense, uh, like my my experience is that is that combining two locators is problematic. A sequence is fairly efficient. Uh, doing things like minus is fairly, fairly doable. Um, so make limit, I like, uh, I like more than make plus. I, I rather take locators for limits than locators for addition, which is also why, if you pay attention here, I created my locator after doing all of my computation here and completely in the rational domain. Uh, if I had swapped this, so then, you know, I would have had a make plus over here and a make divide over here and a make power over here. Then it would, like, I would not have been able to show you any results on the screen because it would be too slow.
Am I sure that x smaller than y is undecidable for arbitrary reals? Yes, I'm sure. For our, if you want to talk about arbitrary input, arbitrary reals as inputs, yes, it is undecidable. I don't know, but, but, but I can ask a question. If you imagine two real spin and disclosure sequence, you will find a large enough n where you know, they, they really separate, you won't get close together anymore. Uh, if you, Um, so I think there are a couple of points there. So I think uh, one element that was raised, like if you get the real numbers as Cauchy sequences, don't you eventually find out in the sequence that they're uh, that they're growing apart, that they're that they're separate? Um, you're not. So I think the question. So the question. The, the problem with decidability is you need to know ahead of time when you're going to find that. You need to know that you're that you're going to be done at some point, and that there's no risk that you wait until infinity. Yeah. So the problem is when they're really yeah, close together. You must know the end, otherwise you can't decide. But that's exactly the, the point I was avoiding. Yes. Yeah. So, so um, I think the, the the example to think about is what if what if you have two different Cauchy sequences that both converge to zero, but from the from the opposite side? When do you know that one is smaller than the other? Uh, when do you know that? When when do you know that it's not the case that one is smaller than the other? So yeah, no, it's it, this is like this is like uh, this is not my research. It's known that uh, inequality of real numbers is undecidable. No, equality is undecidable. In, inequality is undecidable. Inequality. Yeah, it's 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 not my research. It's uh, it's known. Equality up to a bound would be decidable. Yes. Yes, and that's where kind of that's now you're now you're thinking like a, like an exact real mathematician. Yes, yes. When you allow yourself for error bounds, then uh, then all of this becomes much more tractable. Um, and in a sense, this error bound is built into these locators. So if I may bore you a little bit, oops. If I may bore you, is the microphone still working? Um, if I may bore you a little bit more with that. Um, Jumping back to the definition of locators, where was that? I guess the error is the delta between the Q and R. Exactly, the, the, uh, the, uh, the error is the delta between the Q and the R. Because if you, if you would have accepted that Q and R were the same, then you're getting exactly an answer. So let's say Q and R is equal, right? So then you get an answer to exactly the question, is Q less than X or is X less than Q? Which I guess, wouldn't actually be the, like if there if q equals x, that's not answerable. But like uh, you you do you do get to the you do get to the to the x. So yeah, now this is all to say the error bound is built in here. So yeah, this is exactly the kind kind of thinking that goes into okay, we cannot do this. We like we cannot compute equality exactly. We cannot decide equality. We cannot decide inequality. But we can sometimes do just good enough that we can get our algorithms running, that we can compute pluses and minuses and integrals and differential equations. Um, is there anything that you have used in with laziness that, that allows you to do something like this? Or is this something totally orthogonal to the algorithm that you have I used laziness to to get any of this going? Uh, no, I haven't. It's a very interesting question of uh, whether that buys you anything. Um, I mean, there's a there's a known link between uh, laziness and memoization, so maybe that maybe that's like the right end. Maybe that's the right angle here, where um, uh, you could maybe avoid recomputing things internally exactly by using laziness. Yeah, great question. I don't, yeah, uh, no, I think. Only by consuming it, you actually compute how much. You so uh, uh, the question is because we're uh, uh, representing every number as infinite. Only by consuming it, we actually choose how much of that gets evaluated. Well, I mean, in, in this representation, it's a function. 
right? So it's laziness in the sense that it's a function that only produces an output when you give it an input. The, the outputs don't pre-exist. So, so yeah, this entire this, this development, this prototype development, would go through in in a language with strict semantics as well. Uh, so I think uh, so. Uh, the comment is linked with Taylor series, and I didn't really understand the how that link works. Um, uh, the production of a data structure can be lazy in Haskell as well. So if you store an infinite data structure, you can only partially put what's stored. Right. If you define an infinite data structure, you can only partially remove it. Right. Which worked pretty well with Taylor series. I don't know if it could work with Docker. Yeah. Um, yeah, I so I don't have anything smart to answer right now. But maybe the, maybe it's an interesting angle. Yeah. And yet, yet because some of the mistakes you could potentially implement as Taylor series have been thinking about Taylor series that you have talked. <laughs> hoping, hoping yeah. So okay, I think there's a there's a request for something about Taylor series. No, I have nothing smart to say about Taylor series. I'm so sorry. I I disappoint. Okay, then the branch equations. <laughs> Did I solve any differential equations? Well, uh, uh, on paper, yes. Uh, I didn't go through the trouble of actually, you know, computing it because I don't expect that to finish before the heat death of the universe. Yeah, I'm wondering if convergence rules would change based on the representation. So in numerics, we have some well understood convergence rules that we can apply to optimize solutions and I wonder if locators make anything faster than other numerical representations. Yeah, I, I think at this point I really have to sit down and, and make it more concrete because uh, I cannot uh, I, I cannot 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 uh, uh, kind of follow the construction without having it down on paper. Yeah. Just curious, uh, which proof the system does this uh, which proof assistant did I end up using for for my developments? I I I, I used Agda and Koch because uh, they have well well uh, uh, they have well um, well developed libraries for homotopy type theory, which was the setting of of my particular work. Um, I think I ended up mostly using Koch, but that's more of a Emacs versus Vim. Uh, Debate. Yeah, I think I think a lot of a lot of people working in homotopy type theory right now would would be inclined to use uh, Akda for fresh developments because it has a very strong support for something called cubical type theory, which is a, ver a certain flavor of homotopy type theory. It's okay. Like it, uh, it changes every every decade decade, I guess. Do you have a working implementation of locators also in Agda? Do I have a working implementation of locators also in Agda? Uh, yes, although the, I, I, I really, the, yes, right? Like, <laughs> it's a few years ago, so uh, I, I, I'm not 100% sure where I have it on the computer or on the internet, but yes, I have it somewhere. Follow-up question, why did you then choose to re-implement it in Haskell? Why did I choose to re-implement it in Haskell? Oh, because, um, uh, um, I think A because I don't know how to com like I like uh, I don't know if Acta has a has an interactive terminal so I don't didn't know how to how to like actually get numbers out. Uh, I think some of the more um, some of the more concrete constructions such as like getting actual digits out uh, would take a lot more effort in Acta because uh, the way I had set things up it needed to be all correct by construction and in in Haskell I can skip the entire correct by construction stuff. Uh, I can just do the computation and trust my piece of paper that I did the right thing. Uh, so I just could get a lot more developments going uh, with less effort and less thinking. Um, I don't know if I don't know if I did, for instance, already the plus operator in Agda. Hmm. Oh, so I think a lot of this. No, so I think rather my my Agda development of this stuff is probably rather limited. 
uh, because the correct uh, the uh, correct by construction stuff makes it a lot more difficult to write the program that actually computes something. It gets in your way. You have to kind of prove that these error bounds that I showed you, like this computation of the epsilon and the tight bounds, you would have to show that that actually gives you the correct result. And that's that was probably too much trouble back in the day, like a few, a few years ago. But you proved that formally for your thesis. Did I prove it formally? Mostly on paper. Uh, some some crucial elements I, I did do in, in, in proof assistance as well. All right then. So if there are no further questions, um, another big round of applause for Auke. And as a last little gift before we retire to our customary location for uh, beer and food for those who want, Farad here yeah. has a little announcement to make. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Farad Meta. For those of you who don't know me yet, uh, I'm one of the co-organizers for Zuri Hack. I'd just like to mention that if any of you are free next week on Friday, we'll also be having the uh, initial uh, let's say kick off meeting for Zuri Hack, uh, and if some of you are interested interested in volunteering to help or have some ideas, you're more than welcome to join us. I have to take a look at the time and the room. Or do you have it already? Okay, let's take a look. Yeah. Friday, tenth of November at seven p.m. ET half. Uh, it's in this, this room. room. It's in this room. Yeah. So hopefully I'll see some of you again. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks. And as a last word from our sponsors, and by that I mean me, um, we are also always looking for volunteers for giving these talks. Um, we don't pay money, but uh, you will have eternal fame and glory and a few hundred YouTube views, so consider doing it. Street cred. Street cred. That's it. <laughs> Thank you.